It's a pleasure to, to join this panel. Thank you, ABA, and also Santiago for the invitation. Uh, as Santiago was mentioning, uh, our first topic is about merger uh, control enforcement priorities from the perspectives of, of our jurisdictions. But as we have an international audience, we have agreed that we would, uh, we would provide you with a very brief overview of the merger control regime in place in our countries prior to talking about merger control enforcement priorities in our jurisdictions. In Brazil, since 2012, we have a pre-merger control system. Eligible transactions are reviewed by CAGI, the Brazilian Antitrust Authority, and pursuant to the Brazilian competition law, a give transaction will be subject to mandatory filing with CAGI whenever it has effects in Brazil. Uh, it amounts to an economic concentration, meaning the acquisition of uh, control of sole, sole or joint control of shares in a company, uh, in some circumstances, minority stakes, uh, also acquisitions of certain assets, incorporation of joint ventures, uh, what we called uh, collaborative agreements, among others. And the third threshold is the turnover threshold. Uh, one of the economic groups involved in the transaction uh, must have recorded revenues in Brazil in the fiscal year prior to the transaction uh, in excess of the higher threshold is 750 million Brazilian reais. And at least one other group involved in the transaction uh, must have recorded gross revenues in Brazil in excess of 75 million Brazilian reais. Turning to merger control enforcement priorities in Brazil, with respect to uh, possible tiers of harm, uh, CAGI has focused historically and primarily on horizontal and um, vertical effects. But in recent years, CAGE has also been looking at conglomerate and portfolio effects. For instance, in the Broadcom Vida VME Ware case, CAGE considered whether the parties both were developers of different types of infrastructure uh, software would be capable of imposing an anti-competitive bundling uh, for their for for offering their their products. In the Stone Links case, Kaji revealed whether Stone, which is a Brazilian unicorn active in the payments sector, if Stone post transaction uh, would be able to tie or somehow to bundle uh, the offering of its acquiring services uh, to the enterprise management software offered by Lynx. In terms of sectors that are on the sp spotlight, sectors that we can expect more uh, greater scrutiny from Kaji, uh, we have, for instance, the healthcare sector, a sector that Kaji has recently imposed remedies on several cases and even blocked a transaction now in May 2023 due to concerns uh, related to the feasibility and the implementation of remedies. And of course, uh, the enforcer indicated that this is a sector that is going through consolidation and also verticalization trends, that's, uh, that's why it is among the uh, priorities in terms of enforcement. Uh, telecom is also one, one of the sectors. In the Oimavo case, uh, Kaji revealed a four to three transaction in which the three major telecom operators split and acquire assets of the fourth player. Way 
uh, which was subject to intense scrutiny and CAD imposed both structural and behavioral remedies. And after the Brazil first uh, uh, auction, 5G auction, now CAD is reviewing a set of network and infrastructure sharing agreements among uh, Whitney, uh, a, a new player in the wholesale network uh, for personal mobiles, and Telefonica Brazil, SEA, one of the main incumbents in the personal mobile market. After eight months, the general superintendents approved the deal without any restrictions, but third parties, three associations appealed to, to the to the tribunal. So a final decision is yet to be issued. Of course, the so-called digital economy is on among the, the sectors uh, where we can expect greater scrutiny. I will relate a, a domestic and remind, remarkable case uh, which involved uh, ZAP Group and OLX. Uh, and uh, resulted in the creation of the largest marketplace for real estate in Brazil. Uh, this case was subject to significant scrutiny and it, CAD, it was one of the cases in the digital space where CAD uh, was open and more flexible in the relevant market definition, assessing competitive pressure from players from different business models and also uh, in, uh, active in adjacent markets, such as the competitive pressure from social media, from uh, search engines, and also from moot product marketplaces. Uh, Kaja also did an in-depth investigation in the well-known Microsoft Activision case. I will not uh, go through details, it's really well-known case, but in Brazil, the case was unconditionally cleared by, by Kaji. Uh, retail is also on the spotlight. It is a sector that's going to consolidation and has also a particularity. The, the geographic dimension of the relevant markets are local. So there have been a number of cases in the brick and mortar retail market where Kaji uh, has imposed remedies uh, as a condition to clear the, the transaction. Uh, just uh, to, to complete my, my remarks, I'd like to call your uh, attention uh, in connection with uh, timing. Well, one thing that if you are going to fire in Brazil, that may have a great impact in, in terms of uh, timing is third part oppositions, which is becoming more and more frequent. frequent. However, uh, Kadri is now more uh, restrict and selective in uh, accepting oppositions, those that cannot demonstrate and articulate their concerns meaningfully are more likely to be rejected. Just to give a sense of that, in 2022, almost a third of the requests uh, for oppositions were denied. But uh, one thing that there's room for improvement is that Cádiz Tribunal is yet to provide clear guidance on the criteria third parties must meet to be admitted as a third party complainant. Finally, an important development, a becoming development is that the overall composition of Cádiz Tribunal will change significantly later this year. By the end of October, uh, the term of office of four out of seven commissioners at Cádiz Tribunal will expire and they will be replaced by names that are going to be appointed by our President Lula and needs to be ratified by the Brazilian Senate. Uh, this, of course, may lead to uh, changes and bring about new enforcement priorities. Uh, so, Lorena, the floor is yours. Tell us about merger control in Chile these days. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mitchell, and um, well, thank you, the ABA and Santiago for the invitation. Very briefly, I will try to go through Mitchell's explanation of the Brazilian regime uh, to contrast that with the Chilean regime. First of all, 
in June 2017, Chile moved from a voluntary merger control regime to a mandatory merger control regime. So somehow for Chile, Brazil, CADE, the US and Europe are somehow the jurisdictions of reference. In our regime, it's important to state that the agency that will enforce the merger control is Fiscalia Nacional Económica, that it's an administrative agency, but it's, it's, it, you don't have a, you know, a, a, a group of people deciding. Basically, you will need to discuss your case with the investigative team, the head of the division, and if the case is very complex, the antitrust prosecutor that was recently appointed uh, by Boric government, uh, and, and his name is Jorge Grumpe. So it's an administrative agency, very speedious in the review. Uh, the, proce the procedural part is very similar to the European uh, approach. We have a notification form that is very lengthy, similar to the form CO, and we have the two stage, phase one, phase two, 30 business days, 90 business days. Uh, and basically the rule of law is that the Fiscalia will need to review if the transaction substantially reduced competition in the market. When you go through phase two, the important thing is that the investigative file will become public. Uh, of course, the scrutiny will be more in depth and Fiscalia will go through the market test and therefore third parties will have a more active uh, you know, role in the investigation. An important difference uh, regarding the Brazilian regime is that in Chile, the role of third party is very restricted. Third parties could file, you know, a position paper. They could explain how they view the transaction, but legally speaking, they don't have the right to oppose or to challenge the, the transaction. Um, after Fiscalia decide, Fiscalia will have three options to clear the, transa the transaction unconditionally, to clear the transaction with mitigation measures or remedies negotiated with the parties in a collaborative approach, or to block the transaction. And only in that case, the parties involved will have the right to challenge that decision before the competition court. So we have a judicial review that is a type of exceptional appeal before the competition court and a very exceptional type of disciplinary appeal before the Supreme Court. In Chile, in these six years, we have had four cases where Fiscalia has blocked the transaction, two cases were withdrawn by the parties, two cases were challenged before the competition court, one case was, over, was overturned and the other one was confirmed but they, and then overturned by the Supreme Court. So in Chile, we have an administrative uh, basically pro uh, procedure, but we have the possibility of a very expeditious review before uh, the judiciary, um, um, you know, competition court and Supreme Court. Enforcement priorities in Chile, um, I would say that first, what we can see after this uh, six years of implementation is that Fiscalia is really focusing on complex cases, these 12% of cases with, with, with remedies and measures, and trying to be very expeditious in those cases where you don't have antitrust risk. So therefore, we have had a, a new guideline on pre-merger notification and read a, a simplified notification form just to uh, ensure that Fiscalia could, could focus on the complex cases. In multi-jurisdictional cases, I would say that the trend is that Fiscalia early on in the discussion will request waivers. And in our experience, they will tend to discuss the cases with relevant jurisdictions to discuss the substantives of the case and also the remedies. And additionally, we have a special division that it's called like the monitoring division where Fiscalia open investigations to review that the parties are complying with the commitments uh, in merger cases approved with commitments. That is uh, something that is very also active in our jurisdiction. And just to mention three important cases, um, that somehow sign how Fiscalia is very focused on the enforcement of merger control. First, we have the uh, Minerva GBS case that I will explain later, but it because has to do with gun jumping. But this was the first case where Fiscalia files a an action before the competition court and request uh, fines for parties that early implemented the transaction prior to the clearance of Fiscalia. Secondly, we have the Bresler Carosi investigation. This was a concentration transaction 
that was below the thresholds, but somehow Fiscalia opened an investigation and reviewed for two years if the transactions comply, exceeded or not, or not the revenue thresholds. Okay, so basically the, the message from Fiscalia in that closing ruling was if the parties are not sure that the transaction is really in the limits of the thresholds or the transaction has important antitrust effects, the suggestion or the recommendation from the authority is that the parties file a voluntary uh, notification before Fiscalia. And finally, I think that two important cases in Chile uh, the, uh, regarding the merger of the Disney Fox merger and the OXO OK Market merger are two cases where Fiscalia, in the context of the merger control review, filed claims against the parties due to the filing of incomplete or false information in the merger case. They file a claim against Disney and a claim against OXO. Uh, those, both, both cases are still in litigation. But what Fiscalia is saying uh, is that there's a special infringement in the Chilean antitrust law for filing incomplete or false information. And Fiscalia is enforcing those cases mainly regarding internal documents and market studies, because of course, in view of Fiscalia, this is very relevant for Fiscalia to be able to have an effective merger control review. And well, those are very, those are cases that somehow show how Fiscalia wants to ensure enforcement in our country. So now, Felipe, if you can somehow highlight uh, the Colombian um, regime. Thank you, Lorena. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much to the ABA and to Santiago for putting all this together. So Colombia has a mandatory pre-merger review regime whereby parties must file the merger if they are active in the same economic activity or in the same value chain. So only if they have a horizontal or vertical relationship, meaning that we do not review pure conglomerate mergers. However, when the transaction has even a, a, a very small horizontal or vertical link, the transaction must be filed and the authority will review conglomerate effects as well. So if it catches the transaction, it will review every effect under, uh, uh, under the, the, the transaction. Um, and not only the parties must have a horizontal or vertical relationship, but also there must be uh, objective threshold uh, uh, within the transaction. Basically, parties must have a minimum of assets or a minimum of operational income within the last uh, year uh, before the merger, uh, which is fairly low in Colombia, is $15 million combined, uh, approximately under current exchange rates. So a lot of transactions get notified in, in the country. It is important uh, to say that the uh, Colombian merger control regime does, uh, has a, a, an effects-based approach. So even if the parties do not have a corporate vehicle in Colombia, if they, have an, uh, if they have a supply in the country of their service or of their products, and there's a, 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 con, a change of control uh, in the businesses in Colombia, they will have to notify before uh, the authority. Um, you uh, may opt for sort of two procedures. Um, if you have less than 20% uh, shares uh, combined in, uh, in every market involved in the transaction, uh, you may uh, opt for a, a fast track uh, procedure uh, under which the uh, merger will be deemed authorized, uh, but you will still have to pre-file the before the authority, but you, you will not have to wait for a sort of an authorization. If you have uh, more than 20% in any of the markets involved in the transaction, you'll have to go for a, a full pre-merger review and wait for the authorization, and you cannot start establishing economic links between the parties uh, in, in, in the transaction before obtaining that authorization. Uh, the transaction will be reviewed by the superintendents of industry and commerce, which is an administrative authority, sort of like uh, what uh, you would have found in, in, in Europe, for example, where they will, the team will uh, investigate the merger and then come up with a decision. If you are not happy with the decision, you may file uh, litigation before 
uh, uh, general courts. Now, in terms of enforcement priorities, I would outline some factual and some sort of substantive. In terms of uh, uh, cases, uh, the authority has uh, been active in digital markets. Uh, I would ha highlight particularly the Amazon iRobot case where the authority found that, that within the retail market, brick and mortar stores uh, did put pressure, uh, competitive pressure uh, on Amazon and other e-commerce sort of platforms. So that's uh, something new and uh, worth reviewing. Uh, second, the authority has been active uh, in conglomerate defects. Uh, there was a case between Coca-Cola and Bavaria, uh, whereby uh, Coca-Cola and uh, Bavaria, which is a, a, the largest and dominant uh, beer company uh, in Colombia, were implementing a JD under which they would do a, a combined production and distribution uh, scheme. Uh, the authority reviewed the merger because it had a horizontal relationship in, in, in mineral water, uh, but it, it actually blocked the merger on a conglomerate defects. I think it was the first time the authority has ever blocked a merger in uh, because of conglomerate defects, saying that it would create sort of a, 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 a two company uh, environment whereby uh, the distribution of both and exclusivities they had created a sort of conglomerate defects that would be negative for competition. In terms of substantive things, um, there have been sort of uh, two or three emphasis by the authority. One is on gun jumping. The authority has updated its uh, review on what constitutes gun jumping with the Avianca Viva case, which I will explain later on. Second, it has uh, sort of uh, updated its merger remedies uh, position, um, uh, which I will also explain later on. But basically, uh, it has departed from the position that remedies should only target the merger, pro identify the problems, the competitive problems identified with the merger. And it has also introduced remedies aimed at uh, improving the market, even if they're, they're not directly related to, to the transaction. And third, it has also updated its uh, failing firm uh, defense uh, considerations. Uh, this is more less than the SIC, more the Civil Aeronautics Board, board would reduce mergers in the airline sector. Um, and, and those are basically the three uh, substantive updates in, in Colombia. With that, I would uh, uh, pass the ball to Santiago for, uh, for him to explain us the Argentinian case. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, Argentina is a bit different from the other jurisdictions that you have heard so far, because Argentina is a post-closing jurisdiction. We remain a post-closing jurisdiction, even though there have been several attempts by our antitrust regulator to create a pre-closing regime. And being a post-closing jurisdiction does create an opportunity on the one side, and it does create other challenges on the other. It is an opportunity because, of course, you can leverage from foreign remedies, from foreign discussions. Uh, it's, of course, it's quite, uh, it's sometimes it's quite easy when you file a transaction that has been cleared all over the world, and then you file in Argentina, you have a certain amount of, you just say, of good, uh, of goodwill towards the transaction when referring to other jurisdictions. Now, it also poses other challenges in the sense that even though this is a post-closing jurisdiction, the authority will review the transaction and they can impose remedies. So, you are allowed to close, you are allowed to integrate the businesses, but on the other side, you have to be very, very careful so as to see how to allocate risk and how to deal in the case of remedies. And Argentina is a jurisdiction in which a lot of transactions actually end up being notified because we have a very low threshold as well. We have a combined threshold of the buyer group and of the target of only $88 million in terms of sales in Argentina and exports into the country. That means that a lot of transactions with some sort of Argentine component end up being caught in it. It also has a materiality exemption which basically deals with that if the transaction value, if the local consideration for the transaction and the assets being transferred in Argentina are both below $13 million, you can actually avoid a notification. Uh, that value is quite, quite low, even by our current, you know, currency exchange standards. So it's quite likely that most transactions end up being part in Argentina. Now, 
As to the procedure itself, uh, one thing that I found interesting in Lorena's comment is, is there is a role of third parties and that is quite new in Argentina. Up until 2018, up until the latest antitrust law, third parties had to try to sabotage a merger control filing by whatever means they could, but they were not allowed to actually file on the merger filing itself. So the market would be filled with these, you know, four par uh, antitrust investigations, which in fact were third parties trying to sabotage a merger control filing. Now parties are allowed to, third parties are allowed to file on a merger control filing, but for uh, the Antitrust Commission does not necessarily need to hear them, nor does necessarily need to issue an opinion on what they're saying, but at least they have a much more aggressive stance right now. Um, another thing that Argentina has that is quite, sometimes when you're dealing with multi-chain matters and, you, and, and, and it's not that quite well known, is that we have also a side procedure, which are the advisory opinions. If you're not that sure whether the transaction actually meets the threshold or not, or whether there are certain doubts regarding the usage of the exemptions, you can actually file for an advisory opinion before the Argentine Antitrust Commission. It's a three-page, four-page technical analysis that you file before the Antitrust Commission. And it's got the great benefit of one, complying with the merger notification deadline, which as of today is of one week after the effective closing of the transaction, but also eliminates any possible concern regarding a late filing in Argentina, which as we will analyze a bit later on, is quite, a, is quite significant. So that's a very effective tool that you have that sometimes, you know, when you're dealing with multi-chain matters, you don't really take into account that you can have so as to stop the clock and to ensure that no contingency will take place in Argentina as regards the effective notification. Just three more things to take into account as to what's on the agenda right now for Argentine merger control. The first one is that we have new merger control regulations, which are effective as of July 6. They will not change those type of transactions that have to be notified, but they mainly deal with the substantive review of those transactions. We will now, we used to have forms F1 and F2. Now we will have an F0 for those very, very quick transactions that should be reviewed by the commission. And the commission has reviewed, uh, has changed its review timeline so as to try to create this more summary type of approach to, to review so as to have more, more effective clearances in a much faster way. There are certain other issues regarding ESG, regarding certain matters as to the compliance with other laws that we can discuss later on that these new forms have, which are quite a novelty. The second one is that the commission is currently working on these guidelines for a fast track analysis. Fast track analysis in Argentina was basically a matter of chance. Is If you had a, some case team, you had a more Literally, there was more there was more of a likelihood for you getting a fast track approval or not now they are working on guidelines that will have objective standards so as to see which transactions fall on this track or not and the last one and this is something that we can discuss later is that we have had several statement of objections issued over the last couple of years this is a new creation in argentina that was created back in 2018 but because of the delay in our proceedings we are now so we have started seeing over the last two three years and which create a very let's just say a much more clear approach as to the concerns that the transaction may have and as to the remedy negotiations that the parties may both may have with the with the authority well that's it for argentina for right now felipe would you like to to kick off our next topic yes so um the, our next topic is gun jumping as you um, all know gun jumping occurs whenever the parties execute the merger uh, merge without uh, having the authorization uh, without informing the authority of the merger or they start uh, merging uh, without uh, respecting the standstill obligation they are imposed um, and um, we uh, wanted to sort of share uh, certain developments in the gun jumping arena in each of our jurisdictions um, in Colombia there uh, was a, a very uh, uh, very recent case on the airline sector, uh, Avianca, which is the uh, largest airline in the country, acquired uh, Viva, which is a, a, a what was a low cost airline in, in the country. Before they informed the transaction to the 
authority, which in this case was the Civil Aeronautics Board, uh, Avianca did acquire, in fact, the uh, economic rights of uh, Viva. Uh, they allegedly implemented sort of a, a separation of management scheme, but uh, they, they did, uh, and this was accepted by the parties, uh, acquire the economic rights of Viva before even filing the transaction, and of course, having the authorization. Uh, so in, in view of these, the SIC, the Competition Authority, pressed charges against the companies, alleging that they had gun jumped, and in this case, uh, and, and it's, just, it's, it's interesting how the authority said, uh, look, you, you gun jump in, in Colombia, it is our position that you gun jump whenever you establish uh, material economic links between the parties uh, without having the authorization of uh, the competition authority for the merger. And this may occur uh, whenever you, for example, uh, acquire an asset uh, uh, or the control of the asset, you start handling an asset of the uh, other company, you start materially influencing the other company uh, through whichever scheme you may uh, design, you start uh, exchanging sen sensitive information, which you wouldn't be exchanging if the parties were still competitors. And in any case, you start materially influencing the, the target. And in this case, what they said is, look, when you acquire the economic interest, uh, the, the, the economic shares of another party without having the authorization, you of course, of course changed the whole incentives of, of competition because you're not gonna compete as strong as you would against someone who, uh, who you know, you, you own its economic interest, interests. So in that case, which was finally settled uh, and, and did not reach to a, to, to a sanction, um, the, the, what the authority said is, if you acquire material influence over the target, if you uh, start handling an asset, or if you change, if you do schemes that change the incentives to compete, then you will uh, be you, you. We will deem you come you gun jumped in in in, in the vis-a-vis uh, -vis the transaction, and we will impose sanctions unless we find uh, a, a rem we find a remedy that that actually uh, give us uh, um, tranquility vis-a-vis -vis the the competition harm we could have done. Uh, with, with that, I would pass uh, the ball to Lorena uh, to explain us uh, the, the recent cases in in, in Chile. Thank you, Felipe. Well, uh, as, as I mentioned, we have in Chile one case, the Minerva GBS case. Uh, both companies were meat producers, uh, basically in Brazil, but exported to Chile. And the parties notified the transaction before the FNE. And in the during the procedure, uh, basically, they uh, decide to close. Prior to closing, they carve out Chile, and then they close the transaction. Fiscalia opens an investigation, and in simple, the conclusions of Fiscalia were as follows. First, they considered that, of course, there was a gun jumping because they closed the transaction prior, prior to clearance, even though during litigation, Fiscalia cleared the transaction without conditions, but of course, it was an infringement of gun jumping. Secondly, Fiscalia stated in that uh, claim that for Fiscalia, carve-outs were not accepted, even though they are not prohibited in Chile and there's no guideline. Fiscalia stated that at least in Chile, carve-outs were not going to be accepted. And thirdly, Fiscalia in the investigation request copy of emails and communications and somehow stated that, as Felipe mentioned, during the interim period, um, the, the commercial decisions of the target, basically pricing and volumes exported to Chile, was decided by the acquirer. So due to the, these three elements, they file a claim. They request a, a fine of $4 million uh, that somehow was important being the first case. At the end of the day, the party settled uh, with a fine of $1 million. But of course, uh, Fiscalia has somehow informally stated that this was the first case, but probably future cases of gun jumping will imply uh, potentially higher, higher fines. Additionally, I would say that even though we have no additional cases, 
In merger control review, we, uh, we start to see that Fiscalia is focusing and jumping, that they started requesting, for example, um, Lean Teams protocols, um, what's going on in the in the interim period in in the depositions of the of the merger control review they will request some information about how the companies are uh, addressing this interim period protecting the target versus influencing the decision of the target so in our view uh, gun jumping will continue to be a very uh, an important priority for the authorities and somehow when you review the minerva uh, gbs case even though we don't have guidelines, Fiscalia mentioned in that claim that they were somehow considering the CADE guidelines for gun jumping, and they mentioned important cases from Europe and US. The Altis case, uh, they also, so, so basically, uh, in our view, uh, we need to somehow comply with in higher standards, and, and also, uh, I think that interim period and, um, and the clean teams will be thoroughly reviewed by the authority in the process of merger review. Uh, Santiago, I pass the floor to you regarding this matter. Thank you, Lorena. So I was just telling you that Argentina is a post-closing jurisdiction, right? So no gun jumping fines. Now, that is true, but the way our law is drafted is that while we're still waiting for this long-awaited pre-closing system in Argentina, we do have a very tough system for the fines of late notification of transactions. And this is something that the commission has been very, very adamant in trying to uncover them. They are doing a lot of advocacy and they have actually issued a lot of fines regarding late notification. Just for your reference, the website of the Argentine Antitrust Commission does indeed have a very specific search engine tool for late filings fines, okay? So they have actually highlighted it on their website that you have a very special place in which you can actually look for all the cases in which they have imposed those fines. Because over the years, what they've actually come to realize is that given that Argentina is, close, is a post-closing jurisdiction, in a lot of transactions, so actually parties started to forget about Argentina and they did not file or, well, you know, I have already gotten clearances all over the world. I don't care, really care about Argentina, it's post-closing. If they find me someday, I'll just pay a, a very small fine and so forth. With the change of the antitrust law, with the new antitrust law that came to pass in 2018, now the daily fine, daily fine for no notification in Argentina can be up to $500,000 per day of delay. Okay, so you can have very significant fines when you fail to notify. And the commission is actually quite emboldened about this issue because there have been already two court precedents in which the parties have actually stated, they have actually stated to, to the commission is that there's no way that you can actually impose to me a fine for something that took place six, seven years ago, a formal omission that took place six, seven years ago. If, for example, I took place in a cartel six years ago, it ended six years ago, then the statute of limitation would actually apply and there would be no fine. Yet in this case, you're actually fining me for the last six years. And both court presidents have stated that given that this is considered an ongoing offense, also every single day that you fail to notify, you keep renewing the offense, then there's no statute of limitations applicable to this accrual of the fine. So if you have a transaction in which you have doubts, it may make more sense to just go with a three-page advisory opinion so as to eliminate any type of concern on that regard. If not, the commission will try its best to try to uncover it. And they are very, 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 very active in the renewing, in the reviewing of financial statements on public sources. And even they're asking for the help of third parties in trying to uncover these, these past transactions. Michelle, do you want to comment on Brazil? Thank you, Santiago. Uh, well, gun jumping has been a priority for Cardiff since the introduction of the mandatory pre-merger uh, regime uh, in 2012. As Lorena mentioned, we do have guidelines for gun jumping. Uh, they were uh, introduced in 2019 
And among the main uh, provisions, uh, the new the, the regulation on uh, gun junking uh, established uh, a new methodology for calculation of fines. And among the many factors that are taken into consideration um, is the value of the transaction. So broadly speaking, what we, we've seen is that uh, the fines that have been applied for cards since the new uh, guidelines entered into force are greater in comparison to the ones that were uh, applied before. In terms of recent developments uh, to have in mind involving gun jump investigations in Brazil, one is very similar to the one that Lorena just uh, described, the fact that Kaji has stated again uh, that carve-outs are not acceptable. I'm talking about uh, a decision handed down a few months ago in the Katina X case, which involved a joint venture among several automotive, so several players active in the automo automotive sector uh, to create a digital platform to enable uh, data exchange in the supply chain. Kaji came to the conclusion that the transaction raised a number of concerns. The parties decided to, uh, to offer some remedies. Kaji Tribunal considered that the remedies were not sufficient to address the concerns and suggested additional remedies in order to approve the, the transaction, but the parties decided to not to, ask, to accept these additional remedies and ended up telling Kaji that they would abandon the transaction. But shortly after, and this is the very interesting point of the, the case and the connection with the gun jumping, they announced a new transaction, a new instruction for our, the original transaction. Um, and Kaji uh, reached to the conclusion that uh, the parties should be investigation, investigated for gun jumping uh, because the new transaction uh, would represent either a violation of the blocking transaction or a new transaction with effects in Brazil. Uh, although the part to say, uh, says, say that the new, the new structure are carving out uh, Brazil, uh, uh, the Kaji claims that the transaction, even though may have effects in Brazil and therefore they should be filed with Kaji before being implemented. Otherwise, the parties would have jump it again and should be fined for that. Uh, a second, uh, two interesting cases, but I'm going to, in benefit of time, to talk more about uh, one of them. Uh, the, the, the transactions take place in the stock exchange uh, environment. Um, in Brazil, there is a provision in the Brazilian competition law that allows companies to acquire stakes in stock exchange environments without prior approval, as long as the acquirer uh, cannot exercise the political rights resulting from the acquired stake. Uh, in this case, uh, the parties uh, structure the transaction in two steps. The first step of the transaction was the acquisition of a minority stake in the target uh, through a private deal. The second step was a, uh, the acquisition of the control of the target by means of a stock exchange transaction. Uh, Kaji opened an investigation for gun jumping, and in their view, uh, the first step was actually an independent transaction because it was executed and implemented by means of an, a, a private in instrument in a private setting. It was not a stock option, uh, a stock uh, exchange transaction. And therefore, it would not be eligible to the exception that 
the parties could implement the transaction prior to obtaining clearance, conditional not to exercise uh, the right, the political rights. And the parties were fined with 60 million Brazilian reais, which is about 20 uh, uh, million dollars, and the highest. Uh, find that it is applicable in gun jumping cases in Brazil. Santiago, let's change the, the subject and talk about the latest developments on remedy negotiation. What are the key cases and current trends in, in Argentina? Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, ever since the new law was passed in 2018, there has been significant change as regards the negotiation of remedies. Back in the day, whenever you had to negotiate remedies with the Antitrust Commission, it would be carried out in a very obscure manner in the sense that you would never have any type of assurances where they would actually uh, accept them or not. There were no formal places in which you could actually, you know, there were no formal procedural stances in which you could actually file them, in which you could actually discuss them. There were no guidelines at all. Back in 2018, when the, the new law was passed, the review timeline was changed, and now there is a specific part of the procedure, which is right after the, the issuance of the statement of objections, in which you are summoned to a formal hearing in which you will negotiate uh, remedies with the Antitrust Commission. And this has led for the Antitrust Commission to start challenging transactions on a much more aggressive than before. Uh, up until a couple of years ago, if you were to ask me about the statistics of how transactions were usually dealt in Argentina, I would say that 95% of all transactions would be clear with no type of conditioning at all. Just less than 1% would have been rejected in the 20 year plus history of merger control in Argentina, and that about 4% would have been subject to, to remedies. Now, if we look at that picture over the last couple of years, that the remedy section has increased in a very much more important, in a, in a very important way. The percentage is much higher and it has actually captured a lot of relevant transactions, which were cleared abroad, but have been challenged in, in Argentina. Our very first statement of objection was issued two years ago in the Disney Fox transaction. Uh, the transaction had already faced certain remedies in Chile and in Brazil. By the time Argentina started reviewing the transaction, those decisions had already been issued. And the commission issued a statement of objection on two markets, on the movie market and on the sports market. The movie market was at the end left apart because the parties were able to show that there were no concerns at all on that specific market. But as regards sports, the commission issued its very first, let's just say, major remedy over the last couple of years in which they ordered the divestment of the Fox brand, of the Fox sport channels to a new entrant in Argentina, and of certain sporting event licenses for this new entrant to start offering their services in Argentina. Now, other than the significance of the case and the significance of the remedies, a key issue here is that the commission understood that they had to put pressure on the parties to actually obtain a swift remedy, a swift remedy implementation, because that had also been a standard in Argentina in which parties used to drag their feet so as to, as to get that uh, remedy implemented. And the solution that they found out uh, that they, they tried in, in this case was quite a novel one. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Argentine soccer, but we basically have two very major soccer teams, which are River and Boca. Those River and Boca matches belong to the premium segment, which had not been discussed in this case, but which belong to Fox. So the, part, the, the Antitrust Commission stated that until the parties implemented the effective remedy, they would have to show one free River Boca match per week until the remedy was implemented. The end result is that the, the remedy was implemented in less than a week and there were no River Volca matches being shown in Argentina. There were no free River Volca matches being shown in Argentina. But that has also shown to the commission the strength that they can have when they impose certain, uh, let's just say, certain additional conditions regarding timing, regarding monitoring, that we're now having monitoring agents being, uh, being appointed in Argentina, which back in the day was unheard of. 
And we have had already a lot of this new statement of objections regarding the sunflower seed market, electrical appliances, in some cases, other additional media, media markets, such as, for example, Discovery Warner right now is being discussed in Argentina, or the Avon Natura case regarding the, the let's just say, the, the household beauty products that they offer. These, all of these statement of objections have led to a much more fluid, uh, conversation with the authority regarding the imposition of remedies, but it has also led to an emboldening on their side. And now they are trying to push uh, more than ever certain challenges to transactions, which, as I mentioned at the beginning, have already been closed. So bear in mind that sometimes the remedies that you may offer throughout the region may end up having an impact in Argentina because of some sort of copycat effect in the sense that the Argentine regulator would say, well, if you did offer this in Brazil, in Colombia, in Chile, why are you not offering me anything? No, I do want some sort of remedy. So it's also very important to try to coordinate on a regional way how to address those, those remedies. Lorena, would you like to, care to comment on, on Chile? Uh, yes, Santiago. Well, um... I think that we are somehow aligning different jurisdictions because remedies is a priority, of course, for the authorities. And also what you can see in Chile within the last years is that these 12, 15% of cases with commitments are an important part of the discussion and of the resources of Fiscalia. Um, I would say that in Chile, at least this is my view, is that uh, Fiscalia is very technical in the discussion of remedies. They have a team of economists and lawyers, and it's a very collaborative, straightforward approach. When they raise the statement of objections, they are very open about the antitrust concerns, and also they are very open about how they're going to review it, for example, in a phase two. So in many cases, we have a very tough and long discussions, economists against economists uh, to discuss the methodology, uh, the economic tools, uh, how we're going to address surveys, uh, how we are going to address uh, you know, the data. Uh, so I would say that in, in complex cases where remedies are involved, the economic analysis is, is essential. And I would say that Fiscalia is very straightforward in that discussion. Sometimes it's a very lengthy discussion with a lot of RF, RFIs and negotiations with economists, but it's a it's very open and, and collaborative, I would say. Um, in trying to very briefly just highlight two important trends, I would say that in horizontal cases, of course, what you see as in every jurisdiction is that Fiscalia will focus when you have horizontal concerns and and therefore divestitures or structural remedies, they will focus on the viable buyer and on the viable package. And that's what you see, for example, at the beginning with the Bayer Monsanto case, very recently with the OXO OK market case, Fiscalia will go in an in-depth analysis of the specific of the market. They will try to construe a divestment package that is reasonable and that is viable in order to sustain the competitive pressure of the market. And they and then they will also focus uh, very closely on the potential buyer. Uh, that is a, an important trend and it was really important in the final clearance of an almost one year investigation in the retail market with the OXO OK market case. And then we have also somehow uh, uh, in horizontal cases, some quasi-structural measures. In the Fiat Chrysler case, that it was of course a multi-jurisdictional case, uh, there was an important overlap in the light commercial vehicles market in Chile. However, the plants of course were not in Chile, we just import uh, automobiles. But what Fiscalia did was that they request a waiver for the European Commission and they discuss the mitigation measures of the European Commission and they requested the parties an extension of what the European Commission has negotiated with the parties regarding a specific plant in Spain, requesting basically that part of the capacity of that plant for X number of vehicles will be offered as an option to a third party, in this case, Toyota, in order to produce vehicles could, that would be in, in the European Commission, you know, incorporated in the European market. But in Chile, we request that a specific volume 
for the Chilean market. So that was a very, you know, special case, but somehow highlighted, as Santiago mentioned, that when, you, when you're working on a multi-J case, you need to have a coherent narrative you need to be coordinated internally because sometimes discussions in other jurisdictions will be important for the local uh, for the local agency, and they will try to be creative in trying to address the local uh, risks with somehow potential measures that are being discussed in other jurisdictions. Um, and for the sake, of course, very briefly, vertical cases are also a major trend in Chile. Santiago recently mentioned the Disney Fox case. We have the Time Warner case. A lot of discussion about non-discriminatory access, um, regulation of dispute resolutions, and firewalls to avoid uh, sharing of, of sensitive information. Um, going forward to uh, remedies, Mitchell. Well, thank you, Lorena. Well, Kaji has been adopting a stricter approach to remedies. As you and Santiago mentioned, uh, um, for instance, in the Disney Fox case, the parties were unable to comply with the divestiture remedies that were imposed, and then Kaji had to review the, the, the remedies. And uh, the, there is, uh, as a result of this and the, the current economic situation, there is uh, an increasing concern with the feasibility and implementation of the remedies. And as a result of this, the main trends are upfront buyers, and fix it for solutions are becoming more common than in the past. Uh, CAG has uh, remedies guidelines and according to the remedies uh, guidelines, uh, they uh, would have a preference for structural remedies rather than uh, behavioral remedies. Having said that, we've seen behavioral remedies they are frequently negotiated to complement and increase the efficiency of structural remedies, but they may also be imposed on a standalone basis. And on this point, uh, it is worth mentioning an outlier case. Uh, earlier this month in June, Kaji finally conditionally cleared the Nestlé Garoto deal, which back in 2004, yes, almost 20 years ago, uh, when Brazil post-merger regime was still in force, uh, was blocked by Cádiz Tribunal, and which was then taken to court. Almost 20 years later, many things, many developments before the Brazilian courts, before Cádiz, the market changing then, Taking into consideration changes in the market dynamics, Kaji cleared the transaction subject to solely behavioral remedies. In short, the parts agreed uh, to include a 5% market share limitation on display acquisitions of companies, brands, assets in the chocolate market uh, over the next five years. And any acquisition below the 5% threshold must be filed with Kaji, regardless of whether the, the mandatory thresholds are met. And uh, aside, uh, besides, uh, they, they also um, other minor requested other minor commitments to ensure that uh, entry barriers would remain unchanged. Uh, well, there, there, uh, in, in terms of giving you uh, so, sort of examples that Kaji uh, combines uh, not only uh, behavioral remedies, uh, but also structural remedies. There was this Localiza Unidas case where the first and the third largest car rental companies in Brazil combined their business. The authority required the merged entity uh, to divest the Unidas brand and part of its car rental business. But Kaji also required the departs not to acquire companies for three years to prevent further consolidation in the industry and not to exercise non-compete rights in order to improve contestability of the market. 
Uh, last, uh, in the oil model case uh, that I've mentioned to, to you, uh, the Cadiz Tribunal required the parties to uh, divest assets and also imposed behavioral remedies that were deemed necessary to reduce barriers to entry in the relevant markets and promote greater rivalry with the competitors. Last month, Cadiz Department of Economic Studies released a study in which uh, they analyzed all remedies imposed by Cadiz from 2016 uh, to 2020. And the main takeaways are monitoring of the implementation of the remedies has been improved with the appointment of trustees. Second, CAGE needs to be more transparent about monitoring uh, proceeding. And third, most cases that are declared complex in Brazil, uh, there is uh, this possibility where when a case uh, is declared complex in practice, uh, the, the deadline, the merger review period is extended. So most of, of, of the complex cases are approved with remedies. These are the main takeaways of this uh, study. So Felipe, what are the key Thank developments? You. In Thank you, Colombia? Michelle. Um, so uh, in Colombia, the merger review regime establishes that whenever the authority is in front of a transaction that generates restrictions of competition. Um, it may impose remedies, uh, provided they isolate those uh, issues uh, which affect competition. Uh, so there, ma there must be a, sort of a link between what worries the authority and uh, the, the remedy in and of itself. Um, the authority also, uh, when you read the law, the law says that Structural remedies are much preferred than behavioral remedies, which is in the law. So you will usually find remedies that are structural and accompanied with a behavioral remedy as it is the, it is the case in Brazil and in other jurisdictions. Um, in terms of divestiture, divestiture is the sort of the golden remedy you will find uh, in Colombia whenever you have a uh, uh, a, re uh, a transaction which has restrictions on competition. Um, and it's interesting how the authority has handled uh, those re uh, orders of divestiture. Before, uh, I would say before 2016 or so, uh, what the authority would do is uh, the transaction is authorized and you, you have to divest this, let's say this business, this plant, this company to a third party, right? And what would happen is that a year later, six months later, 18 months later, uh, the parties would come and say, look, we, we didn't find uh, a purchaser of the, of the company, et cetera. So what SIC started doing is the following. They say, look, if you, uh, the, the transaction is authorized, okay, you have to divest this business and you have, let's say nine months or 12 months. If you don't divest, if you don't sell the business, within that period of time, the authorization is uh, false. So uh, you will not be able to merge. And if you merge, the, the, the transaction must be uh, unwind. So uh, uh, all of a sudden, all cases of divestiture, uh, you know, purchases, pur purchasers started to, to appear. Uh, so it's basically a way to align incentives between the authority and, and the companies in remedies. Now, in terms of trends, what we've been seeing is that the authority uh, is, has been adding certain uh, things to the way it imposes remedies. As I was saying at the beginning, the authority is imposing remedies sort of uh, a, a way to improve how the market works. Um, in, in, in the case of Avianca and Viva, what happened when the uh, authority was reviewing the merger is that Viva uh, stopped functioning. So a lot of consumers had uh, sort of tickets which were not used. They, were lo they basically lost their money, uh, 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 at least most of them. And so the authority said when it, it uh, decided the merger as a remedy that Avianca and Viva had to give 
the uh, consumers who had purchased tickets before a voucher for, a, for a, the price of the ticket plus a 50% so they could use them. So it was actually a, an adjudication case, uh, like a class action or so, uh, but within a merger, within a merger remedy. Uh, so that's interesting how uh, 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 they were actually adjudicating uh, on uh, a topic which was worrisome in terms of consumer protection, uh, but, but they linked it to the, to the transaction. That's one thing. The other thing they did is that they mandated the companies, Avianca and Viva, to have an interline agreement with uh, the airline, the public airline in Colombia. So this was actually not related to the case, but it was a way to sort of, you know, promote competition uh, within the market and also to sort of up, up, uplift the the the. Um, a company uh, which is owned by the airline, which is owned by the, by the state, which is uh, Satena. So this is actually very new uh, and, 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 and kind of surprising in terms of, of a competition remedy. And third, you'll, you're going to see uh, this a lot in, in recent decisions from SIC, uh, where, where, you, where the authority imposes remedies, which is that they mandate the companies, if they don't have to implement a compliance competition program. So let's say they mandate, I don't know, a divest, uh, or they mandate a certain, uh, uh, you know, a, a behavior they, uh, they, they want to have a, a, the, the companies, they want the companies to, to apply uh, because of the merger. And then they're gonna say, and you must have a compliance program uh, sort of approved or certified in a way uh, by the authority, uh, which is, uh, nothing related to the transaction in and of itself. And it's a way to promote competition in the market. Those are uh, sort of the, uh, the main developments in terms of or remedies. Uh, we'll now pass to digital markets. Uh, so uh, Lorena, uh, if you uh, wanna kick off. Of course, Felipe. Well, as you know, digital markets some have somehow reshaped uh, competitive dynamics and, and are a big challenge, of course, to the traditional approach uh, of the antitrust authorities. So what had happened in Chile, similar to other jurisdictions, is that, of course, digital markets are an important priority for the authority. Um, important cases in Chile, we have, a Fiscalia has just launched a market study regarding lodging platform networks, basically, Expedia, Booking, Airbnb, they open a, an in-depth study that is part of the authorities of Fiscalia in order to understand how this platform works. And basically the main issues uh, that they mentioned in the launching of this study is that they are going to review vertical restraints, uh, negotiations with, with hotels and potential price suggestions or price fixing, uh, and how uh, these platforms compete uh, with other types of traditional uh, logics. So this is somehow a, a clear message from Fiscalia that they're going to focus on digital markets. Also, uh, the, uh, with the public information that we have is that Fiscalia also has several ongoing investigations on the behavioral side in the cartel division and the unilateral conduct divisions against platforms, global platforms and local platforms. Basically, again, regarding uh, vertical restraints, uh, use of data, etc. In the merger control arena, what we have is two important cases. We have the corner shop Walmart case that was approved by Fiscalia and then rejected by the Mexican authorities. So the deal did not go through. And then uh, some months later, corner shop Uber, that was the transaction that was approved by the Chilean, the Chilean authority. And at the end of the day, it was completed by the parties. In very simple terms, I would say that the three main takeaway of those two cases are the following, at least from the Chilean standpoint. First, that in both cases, the parties file a voluntary uh, filing notification form. And this is important because an, a general discussion in other jurisdictions is what are we going to do with digital markets where they are below the thresholds? 
At least in Chile, as we have the possibility of a vol voluntary filing, what you can see is that probably in a sensitive market as this one, the parties will at least explore the possibility of a voluntary consultation because with that they will have a clear uh, timing and a clear status of the transaction rather than to be open to a potential challenge from third parties uh, or from you know competitors etc so first of all voluntary filing it has been the norm in chile in digital markets merger control review Secondly, is that when you review the, the both cases, Fiscalia was very focused on a dynamic approach. Corner Top is the unicorn, it's a local platform uh, created in Chile, but Fiscalia reviewed a Corner Top that was important uh, from a market share standpoint, not in a um, static way, but in a dynamic way, and analyze how this platform will compete with global platforms and with potential new platforms of competitors in Chile. Mainly, in this case, uh, the apps of uh, the traditional retail, Walmart, Sencosud, and SMU. And thirdly, an important issue here was that this case was investigated during pandemics, and Fiscalia used uh, the pandemic somehow as, a, as an experiment of the market and analyzed how all these traditional retails accelerate uh, their plans of platforms during pandemics and how they challenge corner top. And therefore, this was a, a, a somehow evidence that the market was dynamic, that corner top preference at this point could be challenged by other parties, uh, that the traditional uh, retailers had the possibility to challenge uh, this market and to accommodate in this market. And therefore, the transaction uh, was cleared at the end by, by FICA. Uh, so having said that, Michel, I don't know if you have uh, some relevant cases to mention from the Brazilian side. Sure. Uh, thank you, Lorena. I agree with you that um, digital sector is a priority in a global scope in the antitrust arena. And in Brazil, it's the same case. CAD has analyzed several cases in the sector, released several studies and reports on, 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 on the sector as well. And in the last uh, three years, uh, we've seen not only uh, cases uh, involving uh, discussions on digital platforms, but also uh, transactions involving unicorns and the Brazilian unicorns as well. So uh, in the transactions involved both acquisitions of other companies and fundraising rounds uh, in order to raise money, the main companies involved were companies in the fintech space or financial services space, such as e-banks, so it says bank, mobilis, technology, creditas, and stone. But the only uh, acquisition uh, of that had a um, uh, more in-depth scrutiny was the acquisition of links by stone. Uh, among other factors, given the strong opposition by prominent third parties, including incumbents in the payment, uh, payments market in Brazil, which we may know it's highly, uh, used to be highly concentrated. In general, Kaji is well equipped to review transactions in digital markets, and they are doing the same, the same exercises that uh, Lorena has just described. It. What we have not seen uh, yet is uh, transactions in the digital sector involving, for instance, ecosystem creation, expansion, even killer acquisitions in the digital space. Um, well, while on the subject, in June 2020, Kaj launched a marketing inquiry and sent out requests for information to 18 companies active in the digital uh, space, uh, national, uh, domestic ones, and also multinational companies, asking information on all transactions executed by the, then between 2010 and 2019. A very similar exercise to the one that uh, FTC did in uh, February 2020. Right now, CAG's uh, Department of Economic Study is doing an economic assessment of the data that was collected, but the goal of this market inquiry is not 
uh, really clear. One of the possible outcomes that may uh, result from this study is that uh, whether or not uh, Kaji should review its uh, thresholds for transactions involving companies in the digital sector. And a final remark about a trend that we are seeing in the merger review of uh, in digital uh, trans markets involving digital players outside Brazil, but we are not seeing in Brazil. We are seeing this, for instance, before the European Commission, before the CMA, where internal documents have been used by the enforcers to investigate whether there is inconsistency between the parts arguments in the filing form and their actual views on the market dynamics and closeness of competition, among others, and whether certain transactions had the purpose, the rationale of eliminating competition from a potentially uh, disruptive player. With that, I will uh, ask Felipe to tell us about developments in Colombia. Thank you, Michelle. So one common question um, we often have uh, when it comes to digital markets is, uh, what happens when the, uh, the, the company doesn't have a, a material link, in corporate link to the country, uh, but does offer the product or service here? And the answer of the authority has been consistently that if the parties do supply a product or a service in Colombia, the transaction will have to be uh, informed uh, in uh, the country, uh, at least uh, uh, if, if both parties are in, 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 in the market, um, even if they have no corporate vehicle. So that's, that's one of the, the, of the first things I, I, I wanted to highlight. Uh, in that case, you will have to take into account assets or income of the companies abroad, uh, which of course, since the thresholds here are so low, uh, they will be met. Uh, second, um, when you read uh, the decisions of the authority here in Colombia, uh, you find similarities on what Lorena was saying before, and, and it is that uh, the authority has taken sort of a dynamic uh, position when analyzing digital markets. I would group uh, those decisions uh, and not comment them in for the interest of time, but uh, they, they do recognize that there is a dynamic element, which is different from uh, uh, analog markets, uh, if, if you wish. Um, and of course, that takes into account that uh, you, you may have, let's say, a blockbuster 20 years ago, now you have a Netflix, uh, now you have a Disney, et cetera. Um, and, and, and that's sort of embroiled within the decisions of the authority. Um, and uh, what I will also say is that even if the authority is strict when defining markets, let's say, uh, I don't know, in, in the uh, in, in a domicilios.com uh, uh, merger with iFood here in, in, in Colombia, uh, they wouldn't take into account brick and mortar restaurants. They will recognize a certain competitive pressure from, uh, uh, from that segment, uh, which is sort of a strange in terms of uh, competition analysis, but the authority oftentimes recognizes the strong competition uh, from uh, sort of brick and mortar uh, businesses. And, and that is something sort of positive in terms of, of, of mergers being cleared or at least condition uh, here in the country. Um, with that and from the interest of, for the interest of time, I, I would pass uh, the floor to Santiago. Thank you, Felipe. In, in Argentina, there haven't been that many major blockages regarding the, the digital markets, uh, the digital market companies that are operating in the country. Now, there have been several issues that have been raised as so as for the commission to start looking into. The first one is that the commission uh, is looking at the Argentine unicorns. We have several, such as, for example, Mercado Libre, De Pegar, Globant, in which they have been filing virtual control notifications in Argentina, but there haven't been that many challenges or questions raised on those transactions. And the reason for that is that the first one is that 
in a little bit like what Felipe was saying, market definitions have been in some cases quite generous in the sense that, for example, in terms of software development, uh, the, the usual standard in Argentina is for the markets we consider as global. So you are, it's, it's one of the few cases in which global markets have actually been accepted by our competition authority. For example, in the case of online travel agencies, there have been several cases in which they have accepted the competition from brick and mortar agencies. So, so far there has been a market in which they have not raised concerns. Now, there's been talk as of late of two things. The, uh, and one is a bit of a fallout because of their frustration of not being implementing the first one. The first one is that the Antitrust Commission is, has been looking into whether they could try to get transactions that fly under the radar, that do not meet the commercial control threshold, like Lorena was saying, but to get them to analyze them anyway, okay? Because they are seeing that there have been major transactions that, for example, escape the antitrust commission because of the materiality test, they cannot make it, so they will, uh, they, they actually lose the power to review those transactions. They really cannot force a notification in Argentina because the law is quite clear on that. You only have to notify if you meet the thresholds. So the next best thing that they are looking into is that in these new uh, fast track procedures that they're working on is that the, the entire digital market, uh, let's just say ecosphere, will not be able to use any type of fast track procedure. So even if you're adding app, 0.001% of the global market, we're still going to have a full form and they will look into the transaction in more detail because they are very, very concerned about killer acquisitions and how they will operate. And one final issue is the issue that also was mentioned by Felipe in the terms of sometimes the value allocated to Argentina may be a little bit obscure, may, little be, may have a little bit of questioning as to whether the transaction needs to report it or not in Argentina. And that is the reason for which, for example, WhatsApp, Facebook was not notified back in the day in Argentina, but is now being subject to a very intense scrutiny by means of a conduct investigation. And the commission has publicly spoken about the transaction saying that that's one of those transactions in which the merger control system is not working if they're being allowed just because of of a, let's just say, of a special uh, allocation of the Argentine uh, consideration. So, Michelle, would you like to move on to the next topic, which I think, in the interest of time, may be our last one? Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, Santiago. Kaji, with respect to whether uh, the true impact of ESG and other non competition related matters on the approval of transactions. Kaji has today suggested that it is not inclined to incorporate ESG and other non-competition related matters into merger review. In fact, Kaji's president, Alexandre Cordero, said in an interview that um, uh, bringing these matters would introduce uh, legal uncertainty and subjectivity to the antitrust analysis, and that's why he is uh, against it. Having said that, in at least two cases, Kaji uh, has touched upon ESG and other non-competition related matters. One is the oil mobile case that I told you, uh, that I mentioned to you before. The social impact of oil's removal from the market could be huge if the transaction didn't happen and was used as an argument for the deal's clearance. Just to, have, to, to give you a sense, we were talking about 120,000 jobs, uh, fiscal impact of around 5 billion per year, discontinuity of services that were crucial for other essential services. Other than that, sustainability-related corporation schemes among competitors are on the spotlight but not because of the sustainability portion, but because of the collaboration among competitors. One case that is set to be decided on next Wednesday is the, J the Agroja V case, which is a digital platform that wants to enable the standardization of sustainability measurement in the food and agricultural uh, supply chain. Kaji, uh, is not uh, is, is 
Card Tribunal concluded that the proposed standards are not clear and it's not uh, very also unclear uh, if there would be any restriction or rule for implementation of the new standards. Another concern is that if the, the joint venture could create discriminatory standards that would have uh, competition uh, effect on competition and uh, to what extent the safeguards to prevent and competitive behavior among the competitors in the JV through private in instruments would be effective. So uh, we are very much looking forward to see uh, whether uh, it's going to be the, the final decision uh, on the merits of this case next Wednesday. Santiago, what the, are the major developments in Argentina? In, in Argentina, I think we're moving in a different direction in the sense that ESG is now getting a bit more uh, important in the discussion. We have seen that in already in two statement of objections as of the last year, in which the first one, one of the key issues that was negotiated with the commission was that no facilities in Argentina would be closed and that the jobs would be kept. And that's part of the of the that was part of the remedy negotiation with the antitrust commission. And the second one is that right now there is an ongoing set of objections in which one of the defenses posed by the parties and which was acknowledged by the commission in its statement of objection as to saying we are negotiating on this matter is that there will be more local manufacturing of products that used to be imported. Uh, that used to be to be imported into Argentina, and that this local manufacturing will generate hard currency, which is a much needed asset right now in Argentina. So that's something that the commission is actually taking very much into account. And in fact, the new merger guidelines do state on the as to the new F2 form, let's just say the form that you need to file for those very complicated transactions. There is a section regarding, you know, the usual efficiencies, and then there is another section in which you can provide other non-competition related related factors, such as, for example, whether you can argue that the transaction will create jobs, that it will foster uh, a better, uh, let's just say, a better care for the environment, that there will be local manufacturing, that it will create hard currency. And it can even foster gender equality. So this is much more of a, let's just say, of a defense that parties have right now. As of late, it has been used by the commission, not so as not to object transactions, but also to include them in the negotiation, something like what Felipe was mentioning a couple of, 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 of questions back. Uh, and now it's going to be a defense that the parties can file so as to justify the transaction other than the usual antitrust uh, defenses. Lorena, how about Chile? Well, this is a very sensitive topic, but I think that in Chile, at least for now, um, there's a technical approach and the theory of harm will be focused on, on competition issues and non-competition you know non -competition issues. But of course, I think you, we need to be open to these trends because these are global trends that these elements are somehow being included in the discussion. But at least in Chile, we have not seen that these elements are part of the argument of the parties, nor part of the rationale of the of the decision of the competition authority. Um, we have a case, the, the Tianqi case, where a Chinese company acquired a minority share holding in SQM, the, the main lithium local company in Chile, and third parties tried to challenge that transaction, even though it was not a, a merger case because it was a minority share holding, but uh, due to uh, non-competition considerations, national interest and others. And what Fisc Fiscalia said in that case was that Fiscalia review, open an investigation, review the competition issues, mainly sharing of information between among clients and firewalls, and that they were not going to focus or, or construe any theory of harm that is not related to anti-competitive issues. But if I have to give an advice, and this is my advice to clients, when you are involved in sensitive markets, mining markets, sensitive for Chile, I would say that all these non-competition issues need also to be included in the analysis. The, the Fiscalia does not work in a vacuum, but they not, they're not need to be included in the theory of harm or in the arguments, but we need to discuss that because what will happen is that those cases probably will be analyzed in a more 
acid way, in a more strict manner by the authority. Therefore, we will need to explain efficiencies, uh, um, you know, not harm to competition in a very more uh, strict way uh, in those type of cases. Uh, and now, Felipe, I think you're the yeah. last one in our last question. Uh, just, since we're out of time, just it works the same in Colombia. Um, we have a technical approach. Uh, the authority has a technical approach. Uh, although in, in the recent case of Avianca, you had they, they said, since it was a failing firm defense, they said, look, Viva should continue uh, to operate uh, as a company. And I think there was a job issue uh, behind that rationale, not, not only a, a competition consumer thing, uh, but in general terms, uh, you focus on technical, economic, legal stuff rather than ESG considerations. So with that, I will pass the floor to Santiago to conclude. Thank you, thank you, Felipe, and thank you all for for joining for for this this discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time. We we maybe we should have booked for two hours because uh, it was a lot of fun getting to, into conversation with our friends. But thank you for joining in. Thank you, Michelle, Lorena, Felipe, and great seeing you all here. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.